Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors, I am excited to welcome you to today's Open Mind program with Dr. Dilip Chesty, world-renowned neuropsychiatrist and author of the new critically acclaimed book, Wiser, The Scientific Roots of Wisdom, Compassion, and What Makes Us Good. Dr. Dilip Jesty will be joined in conversation by Dr. Shafali Jesty, his highly accomplished daughter, who is a professor of psychiatry, pediatrics, and neurology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. For over two decades, Dr. Dilip Jesty has pioneered the exploration of the biological and cognitive roots of the neurobiology and psychology of wisdom. In Wiser, he shows us how we can take control of our lives by increasing our wisdom. He has many titles, but with his permission, I'll share just a few. Dr. Jesty is Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosciences, Senior Associate Dean for Healthy Aging and Senior Care, and he holds the Estelle and Edgar Levy Memorial Chair in Aging, all at the University of California, San Diego. He is also the past president of the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Shafali Jesty is a pediatric neurologist and the recipient of the 2019 Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Her research is focused, in, focused on developing more precise methods for early prediction and diagnosis of neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism. She was recently named Chief of Neurology at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles and will begin her tenure there in July. We would like to thank both of our distinguished scholars, the extraordinary father-daughter duo, Doctors Jesty, for taking the time from their busy schedules to share their knowledge and expertise with us today. A quick announcement before we get started, our final Open Mind program of the spring 2021 season will be held on Thursday, June 24th, 5 p.m., when we welcome Michael Moss, renowned author of the new book, Hooked, Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions. Excuse me. He was joined in conversation by Dr. David Heber, the founder of the UCLA Center for Human Nutrition at UCLA. Please visit our website, friendsofthesemelinstitute.org, to make your reservation for this program and to see a complete listing of all our upcoming fall Open Mind events. There you will also find a link to our YouTube channel, which has a complete library of videos from past programs and our recent WOW 2021 fundraiser. We hope you will enjoy exploring and watching those you may have missed. Today's program will run for one hour and 15 minutes, ending at approximately 6.15 p.m. It is being taped and will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Lastly, the last segment of today's program is reserved for your questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible during the time allotted. Now, let's give a warm Zoom welcome to Dr. Dilip Jesty, who will speak first and then welcome Shafali to join him. Thank you so much. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Vicky, for a kind introduction. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here at the Semmel Institute. Uh, Semmel Institute is one of the premier institutes on neuroscience and human behavior. And I truly feel privileged to be talking with you. Let me share the screen with my slides and Okay, I think uh, y'all can see my slides, right? Good. So I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Shafali for taking time to join. Shafali is more busy than I am 
and I'm really happy that uh, she can be here. So I'm going to talk about wisdom. And the very first question that comes up is, what is wisdom? Wisdom is a personality trait. It's a trait like neuroticism or extroversion, introversion, resilience. But it has multiple components. And what are the components? There are six of them that I will show you on this slide. They're the main ones. The most important one is pro-social behaviors. The things that we do for others than for ourselves. Empathy, compassion, altruism. Second one is emotional regulation, control over emotions. Think about a teenager. His emotions fluctuate from minute to minute. And then think about a wiser, older person with pretty good control over the emotions. Then comes self-reflection. This is the ability to look inwards and try to understand our own behavior. You know, when something goes wrong, it's easy to blame somebody else. But maybe it is something wrong that I did that caused it. So that is self-reflection. Then comes one thing that is sadly lacking in these days, that is accepting uncertainty and accepting diversity of perspectives. So I may have strong values about something, but I can understand why somebody else may have different values and we can still be friends. We can still respect each other. Decisiveness. So although we accept uncertainty and diversity of perspectives, we have to be decisive when needed. We cannot be sitting on the fence all the time. And the last and probably the most controversial component of wisdom, not accepted by everybody, is spirituality. Spirituality is different from religiosity. Religiosity refers to organized religion. Spirituality doesn't have to do with religion. An atheist can be spiritual. Spirituality means constant connectedness. Connectedness with something or someone that we can't see or hear, whether you call it spirit, soul, consciousness, or God. So those are the components of wisdom. The question is that how do we measure wisdom? As I said, wisdom is a personality trait. And most personality traits are measured by scales that are a bunch of items that describe behavior. And you have to say to what extent you agree or disagree with those statements about your behavior. So we developed the San Diego Wisdom Scale or just the Thomas Wisdom Index. Michael Thomas is my colleague, psychologist and expert in scale development. So our scale has 28 items, each to be rated on a one to five scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. We have shown that it has good to excellent psychometric properties. It is already translated into more than half a dozen languages. I want to give you just two examples of the items. One is, it is important that I understand the reasons for my actions. So this is self-reflection, trying to understand why I did something. Another item is, I have trouble thinking clearly when I'm upset. So this is opposite of emotional regulation. That means when I'm upset, they, my emotions overtake me and I cannot think logically. I think everybody should take this scale or some other scale for wisdom. And this scale, by the way, is there in our book as well as on our website. While describing the scale, I should also mention that wisdom like other personality traits, is biologically based. It is based in the brain, obviously. Where in the brain? Two main parts of the brain that are involved in wisdom are prefrontal cortex, which is the newest part of the brain in evolution. And the other part is striatum, especially amygdala, which is the oldest part of the brain in evolution. So it's fascinating to think that wisdom involves newest and oldest parts of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, within that, there are specific regions that are important. Dorsolateral, ventromedial, anterior cingulate, insula is also important. And in the striatum, amygdala is critical 
at an emotional center. About uh, seven, eight years ago, we did a study of what happens to physical and mental health with aging. So we put together a large sample of about 1,500 people se selected using random digit diary. And we have been following that sample now for about 10 years from age 21 to 100 plus. And we wanted to see, as I said, physical and mental health. So physical health, as you see, is at its highest in the 20s and 30s. That's a fountain of youth, right? The physical health is at its best. And after that, it starts slowly declining up to 60 and 80. Of course, it decline becomes faster. What about mental health? What about mental well-being? It goes exactly in the opposite direction. And that is the paradox of aging. So 20s and 30s, it's a fountain of youth, I said. It's also a fountain of depression, anxiety, stress, distress. This is a group in which suicides are rising. The good news is that as we get older, we get happier. And happiness is not the only thing that improves with aging. A number of studies have shown that several ability areas are better in older people than in younger ones. They include emotional regulation. So as we get older, we have better control over the emotion. Positivity. In younger people, the negative things, negative memories, negative incidents are like a Velcro. In an older person, they are like Teflon. They don't matter. Then comes empathy and compassion, the things that we do for other people. Self-reflection. And finally, decisions that require experience because experience comes with aging. So if you just remember the slide I showed you about the components of wisdom, these are all components of wisdom. So there is a lot of data, mostly cross-sectional though, that suggests that older people have higher levels of components of wisdom than younger ones. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. And one thing I have wondered for a long time is why do we age? Why do humans age? Because human aging is inconsistent with Darwin's hypothesis of survival of the fittest. What is Darwin's hypothesis? He said that animals, vertebrates, live only so long as they can produce children, right? Because we need to produce children in order to make up for the loss of the dead ones. Then only the species will survive. And that's what happens for most animals in the wild, not to humans. We lose our fertility around the age of 45, 50. That's called menopause in women, andropause in men. And yet we live, let's say, if somebody lives to age 90, that means they have spent half of their lifespan without fertility, without contributing to the species survival. How is that possible? How does the nature allow that? So must be something improves with aging in later life. So there is something called grandmother hypothesis of wisdom. What's the grandmother hypothesis? So you see in the picture that at the top, those are the grandparents. And of course the grandma is more important than the grandfather. Then you see in the middle row, uh, an adult daughter. If the grandma helps the adult daughter raise children, the adult daughter lives longer, is happier, and produces more children than her mom did. So the grandma, she cannot produce children anymore, but she can help happiness, longevity, and fertility of the younger generation. And that is a grandmother hypothesis. And by the way, this is the research that has been published in the top journals, such as Nature and Science. Some of my colleagues at UCSD have reported on the presence of what they call grandparent genes. These are variants of CD33 and APOE that allow your brain and heart to function well into old age. And 
the usefulness of older people for younger generation goes beyond fertility. This is the last study of um, 1500 plus secondary school students between the ages of 11 and 16 in the UK. They followed these kids and they found that when grandparents were involved in raising these kids, as the kids grew up, they had fewer emotional problems, more pro-social behavior and fewer adjustment difficulties than the kids in whose upbringing grandparents were not involved. And this was especially true for teenagers coming from single parent or step parent families. These are the kids who are at the higher risk of emotional or adjustment problems. Then there is something which everybody should Google and read about it. It is called experience score. This is a study that was done at Hopkins about 20 years ago, funded by MacArthur Foundation. Actually, Dr. Seaman, who was one of the Main investigators in the study is now at UCLA. An amazing study. It was a randomized control trial. What the researchers did was they took some older people from the community who had retired. They divided them into two groups. One group agreed to spend at least 15 hours a week in a public elementary school. The other group didn't do that. And then they followed these kids as well as older people for one year. They found the kids, of course, their grades went through the roof. They were very happy. But older people, those who helped these kids, their physical health improved, mental health improved, biomarkers of stress and aging in blood and urine improved, and the volume of hippocampus on brain MRI was larger at the end of the study in people who participated in this intervention with the students compared to those who did not. Now, this does not mean that the volume of hippocampus increased. What it means is it did not shrink the way it did in the controls. So how come things improve with aging? Research in the last 25, 30 years has clearly shown there is something called neuroplasticity of aging. Brain can continue to grow, develop, evolve in later life provided people are active, that is critical, active. And active physically, mentally, and socially. Okay, all three of those. So studies have shown that in active people, as they age, there is greater recruitment and more efficient utilization of neuronal networks. Studies have shown, including various animal species, that there is formation of new synapses and even new neurons in subcortical regions of the brain. It doesn't happen in the cortex, but in the subcortical regions, there is increased number of neurons. And why do we feel happier in older age? Because the amygdala becomes less active with negative or stressful stimuli, including regret and fear with age. Of course, this uh, neuroplasticity ends when the cognitive decline takes over and somebody develops dementia. But till that point, actually the brain can continue to grow if you keep yourself active. Now I want to talk about something at the other end of wisdom, which is loneliness. Loneliness and social isolation. You know, we all know about COVID, the terrible pandemic that we had last year. People don't know that there is a behavioral pandemic that has been going on for the last 20 years. That's the pandemic of loneliness, social isolation, suicides, opioid-related deaths. Loneliness has been called a silent killer. It increases odds of mortality by 30%. It is as dangerous to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and more dangerous than mild to moderate obesity. In the US, 162,000 people die every year from conditions attributable to loneliness. There's more than the number of deaths from lung cancer or stroke. And this is not just a health issue. It's also a business issue. In the UK, a new minister of loneliness was appointed in 2018. So it's a major pandemic, but we don't know about it because it is silent. The good news is that we have a vaccine for that. 
and that vaccine is called wisdom. Number of our studies have shown, and actually other people's studies also have shown that loneliness is associated with worse physical and mental health, whereas wisdom is associated with better physical and mental health. Ours were the only studies that included both loneliness and wisdom. And we found multiple studies with several thousand people across the country and even internationally showing that the inverse correlation between loneliness and wisdom, higher the wisdom, less the loneliness and vice versa. And we have even shown this biologically in EEG and microbiome studies. We just have a paper now about to be accepted, which was a longitudinal study. It showed that high level of compassion and other components of wisdom at baseline predicted lower level of loneliness seven years later. And something exciting is that right now we are developing a new intervention, new behavioral intervention to increase compassion in order to reduce loneliness. So there's compassion training to reduce loneliness and associated risk of suicides, opioid use, and so on. So can we really increase compassion? Can we really increase wisdom? The answer is yes. We published a meta-analysis of 57 randomized control trials that focused on enhancing specific component of wisdom. And there are three components that were studied. One was pro-social behavior, empathy, compassion, altruism. Second was emotional regulation. And third was spirituality. And these were studies done in people with mental illnesses, physical illnesses, as well as those from the general community. Half of these studies reported significant enhancement of the specific component of wisdom with moderate to large effect size. This is really impressive because these were well done studies and they showed that you can improve component of wisdom in a significant proportion of people, not in everybody, but in many people. So that is all good for research, but what do we do in everyday life? How can we use wisdom in our everyday life? So practical wisdom really means wise decision-making, the decisions that we make in everyday life, right? Not talking about small decisions, but decisions that have impact on our own health and behavior as well as other people. So what is needed is forming a habit of making wise decision. What is a wise decision? Wise decision is something that in involves self-reflection, emotional regulation with positivity, empathy, compassion, decisiveness, I mean, uncertainty and spirituality. So all the components of wisdom. So the first step in becoming wiser is finding out what we are. Where do we stand in terms of different components of wisdom? So take a test for wisdom, as I said, um, this um, San Diego wisdom scale, uh, and that will tell you what components you are strong in versus once you are weak in where we may need some help. Okay, so if I find that my compassion level is low, what do I do? So there are ways in which we can enhance compassion. One is role playing. You know, put on blindfolders, blindfolds for 48 hours, or try to be in a wheelchair for 48 hours. You will come to empathize with people who are blind or who are in a wheelchair. Keep a gratitude diary. Before going to bed, write a couple of things that made you feel grateful. And just practice some random acts of kindness to strangers. We talk about compassion toward others. Equally important is compassion toward yourself. How do we do that? By making a practice of offering yourself soothing and comfort the same way you would do to a friend. So when you're stressed out, offer yourself comfort rather than blaming yourself. Sense of common humanity. Accept the fact that everybody makes mistakes. If you made a mistake, that's bad, but everybody does that. And then mindfulness, that you have gone through similar stresses in the past, you have survived, you'll survive this one too. Other wisdom strategies include, and this is important, spend time with people who are different from you. We all spend time with people who are like us, who are, share our views. I think that comes in the way. Set aside time for self-reflection. Make it a habit 
to at least three times a week, spend half an hour thinking about what you did, how you felt over the last few weeks. And finally, decision-making. Sometimes people can't make a decision because they're worried about the long-term consequences. Well, we don't know what the long-term consequences are going to be. Make a decision and live with the consequences which may change over a period of time. So this is my last but one slide. So I've been talking about individual level wisdom. What about societal level wisdom? You know, today we have been living in a society that is highly stressed, polarized. And I'm not talking about just the last year of COVID. As I said, this has been going on for the last 20 years. We are increasingly stressed, increasingly polarized, angry. There is not just dislike of others, there is hatred of others very anxious, depressed. The rates of suicide have gone up by 33% in the last 20 years, according to CDC. So the way to control the pandemic is promote wisdom. We focus too much on hard skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, how to be a best diagnostician or um, webmaster or whatever. We should also reward, teach and reward soft skills compassion, self-reflection, acceptance of diverse perspectives. We need to do that. We need to do that for students from kindergarten onward in graduate schools, medical school, in businesses, and God forbid, even politicians. So this is my last slide. So if we do that, really, if we start working at the societal level, improving the education, we can transform today's lonely, distressed, and polarized world into a happier, healthier, and wiser society. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will turn over to Shafali. Uh, and uh, at the end, there will be time for question and answer from uh, the audience. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you, Dad. Um, and thank you to the Friends of Semmel for inviting me um, for this amazing opportunity. I have to say, I've, I've probably given not as many talks as my dad, but hundreds of talks on Zoom. and. I've had the chance to interview some folks here and there. I've never interviewed my father. Um, and so this is a real treat. Um, you know, my dad has had a very profound influence on my life, really in innumerable ways. You know, I think about my dad as the one who, when I was, you know, three and four years old, would create cereal eating competitions to trick me into eating breakfast because I never wanted to eat breakfast because he knew I needed to eat to have energy for the day. Um, all the way to, you know, into my adulthood, really being the one who helped me weigh complicated personal decisions, career decisions. Um, and, you know, my dad has also really been a mentor by example. You know, dad, you and mom came to this country from India shortly before I was born with very few resources outside of a very, very strong education, a lot of intellect, and a tremendous amount of ambition. Um, and what you've accomplished, I'd say, is pretty extraordinary. And I'm sure everyone in the audience agrees with that. Um, so I just have to, you know, emphasize to the audience members that my dad really lives the principles that he espouses in this book. Um, and again, has really been um, someone that I've um, looked up to uh, for my whole life, for sure. Um, so, um, you know, I wanted to first ask you a little bit about your journey to writing this book. You know, I mean, you're a psychiatrist. You study mental illness. You um, are very well known in the field of schizophrenia. And before that, in terms of dyskinesia, you know, how did you move from studying pathology, if you will, to thinking about um, wisdom as a construct, and maybe even larger in the construct of sort of positive psychiatry, as I know you've also written quite a bit about? Thank you. Uh, first of all, actually, I want to say that uh, um, I'm blessed with three amazing women in my mm -hmm. life. Uh, my wife, Sonali, is a child psychiatrist, and two daughters, Shafali, of course you know her, and Neelam, the younger one, who is an oncologist. And they actually have taught me so much wisdom <laughs> that uh, I can't thank them enough. Uh, so coming to your question, Shafali, um, so I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. So I focus on studying older people. And uh, I was studying schizophrenia for many years. And I was surprised to find that people with schizophrenia, those who survived into older age, mm -hmm. actually their mental symptoms improved, mm -hmm. which was opposite of what one would have expected. And some of you may have seen the movie Beautiful Mind. It's a true story of uh, John Nash, Nobel laureate who had suffered from schizophrenia, started getting better. 
Then we did a study that I showed you the slide about where actually the paradox of aging, right? Physical health declines, but mental well-being improves. And so why does it occur? I mean, I, I thought that was a mystery. And then I remembered when I was growing up in India, like most Eastern cultures, we were taught that older people are wiser. We should respect them because they're wiser. And it suddenly struck me that maybe people are getting happier because they may be wiser. But wisdom, wisdom is not a scientific entity. It's a province of uh, priests and philosophers. Around that time in 2007, actually I remember very clearly in May of 2007, there's a, an article published in New York Times Sunday Supplement by Stephen Hall. The title was Older and Wiser Hypothesis. And it, it's a long article which describes some research being done on wisdom. Until that time, actually, I didn't know that there was research being done on wisdom. And so I read the article, I was fascinated. I said, wow, this is something true. So then actually I started with the literature review. And so the first book, actually paper I published on wisdom was in 2008, a year later. And that paper was on wisdom in the Gita. So that's an Indian kind of Bible, which is thought to be um, really epitome of wisdom. Uh, and then in 2009, the paper I published was on neurobiology of wisdom. And so, so I actually, the more I studied, the more I got interested. I'm on mute. You would think after two years of Zoom, I would not do that, but still I do. Um, so no, it's very interesting. I actually remember when you were, um, getting interested in the subject. And I, I will say, I think that just the process, watching the process of first, just doing a very deep lit review and just taking the time to think, you know, which we'll get to later. Cause I think that's something that we don't do enough of. Um, I think that clearly was important for you as you kind of laid the foundation for, you know, this work. Um, so we'll get to more of this, but I have to admit, you know, our whole family took the Just Say Thomas Wisdom Index. <laughs> You know, I'm a little competitive. We all are in the family. Um, both your grandsons, you should know, scored higher than I did. Not surprising. Um, but, you know, I actually found it quite accurate uh, for me. Um, and it, it, I did the scale identified areas in which I really could improve, uh, like decisiveness. <laughs> uh, and in or other areas where I was stronger, like in, you know, pro-social behavior and that sort of thing. But as we were taking the quiz, you know, my, my sons, Nishal and Kiran, who are your grandsons, 14 and 12, who love their ABBA and have known you know, have, have loved you and have been close to you since they were born, said, I bet ABBA aced this test. They were sure you had a five across the board. So we need to ask you, dad, how wise are you? <laughs> well, uh, the question is, of course, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I, for me, taking the wisdom scale is, is really complicated because, I mean, I develop the scale and I'm too familiar with that. So, so I actually look at it from my strengths versus weaknesses within wisdom, as well as whether my score changes over time. And in terms of, so I found out actually that I scored lowest in spirituality um, because it includes things like belief in spirit, belief in um, um, life after death. And these are sort of where I felt I'm neutral. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I also didn't do as well on um, empathy and compassion. Part of that is because I compared myself with my wife and two daughters and I found that I was less so than them. Uh, on the other hand, I did better probably for, for, uh, for myself on emotional regulation and decisiveness. But the second question actually, which you asked just now, actually th that I've not done that before, but I just thought of that. I really think my components of wisdom have increased since I not only started doing research, but since I published this book and I've been giving talks because I found that I was preaching things and I better practice them. So if I preach people to be more compassionate, to be more self-reflective, et cetera, I need to do that myself. And I became much more self-conscious about them. And actually I really find that my uh, scores have increased uh, far from perfect but at least I'm doing better. 
No, and that's actually a really interesting point. I was actually going to ask you next is, you know, do you, did you find that your scores or your, the way you answered these questions changed as you were researching and then writing the book? I found, you know, personally, and if those of you have not done it, it's, it's, there's a, we can put the link in the chat. It's a very quick um, questionnaire, which I like because it is quick, you know, and you can um, take it. But I think the more self-reflective one is potentially the lower one score is, which is sort of paradoxical because self-reflection is, you know, component of wisdom, but it, it was actually helpful because it, it helped me to see areas in which I clearly need work, you know, and I think, you know, for those of us in leadership positions, decisiveness is important and being able to say, you know, I might, I, I might need to, you know, uh, bolster that skill a little bit more, I think is really helpful. So um, I think the scale can be very valuable from that standpoint, you know, outside of just it being a measurement tool. Um, so I want to switch gears a little. I'm going to take off my daughter hat for a minute and put on my child neurologist, developmental neuroscientist hat. Uh, you know, I, I'm a pediatric neurologist. I study um, neurodevelopmental disabilities. And a lot of our work really is in um, thinking about, you know, development in early childhood. How do we enhance, you know, better outcomes, resilience, factors like that? How do we predict certain types of clinical outcomes to be able to maybe even start interventions early? Um, you know, one, one thing we think a lot about in developmental neuroscience is this issue about nature versus nurture, right? So in, in childhood, how much of a child's behavior is genetically or biologically defined or even maybe programmed a bit and how much is able to be modified from, you know, environmental influences. And as you know, a lot of the great, you know, developmental thinkers battled about this issue. Um, you and your book give this great example of the famous Stanford marshmallow experiment, which some of you, if you've read the book, know, if you don't, you know, quickly, it's this great experiment where, um, you know, psychologists at Stanford um, worked with four and five year old kids and they put them in a room with a marshmallow and they said, you know, you have this marshmallow, you can eat it now, but if you wait and don't eat it, we're going to come back in some period of time, it turned out it was like 15 minutes, and we'll give you a second one if you don't eat that first marshmallow. And so really the test was really an executive function test to see how um, these um, kids were able to, you know, manage their impulse control in some ways. And what they found was actually that there was a range of behavior. Some kids ate the marshmallow right away. Some, you know, fidgeted a lot and struggled but didn't eat it. And some were completely fine following the, um, the instructions. But that the kids who showed better regulation and better impulse control early on actually had better outcomes in a variety of different areas like 40 years later, which, you know, suggests that there's some innate you know, uh, uh, qualities that some kids might have that might over time make them perhaps wiser. So the question for you, long-winded question, but I really want to sort of talk to you about this is, you know, how much of wisdom do you think is, you know, nature versus how much of it can we actually improve or teach or grow over time? That's a great question. Uh, this is true. This question also applies to other personality traits from resilience and optimism to neuroticism, extroversion. The, and there have been a lot of genetic studies of some of the other traits, especially the big 5-0, right? Uh, so usually about 50% of a trait is genetically determined. That means 50% is affected by environment and behavior. And even for the 50% that is genetically determined, we know that environment and behavior affect the expression of the genes, right? So environment and behavior actually have much more influence on our behavior than we think we have. Of course, that varies according to the trait. For example, intelligence, IQ, doesn't change much even with training. I mean, unless somebody is in a very poor environment and where they are hurt and then they get into better environment. But otherwise, IQ doesn't change much. That's not true for wisdom. Wisdom does increase. And that's a positive news that we can do something about wisdom. We cannot do something about IQ, but emotional regulation, self-reflection, compassion, empathy, um, accepting diversity, etc. And I think those people in the audience who, who are over a certain age will agree that we are actually much better off today than we were when we were in our 20s, right? Compared to 20s and 30s, we have become wiser. So I do think that that is something that is feasible and should be practiced. So, you know, to sort of follow up on that question, I mean, can children be wise using the, you know, the traits that you describe? 
Uh, because again, some of those, as you said, do come with or develop at least with experience. Um, but you know, so many of those traits, especially the pro-social behavior, just emotion regulation. I mean, those are things that we really try to bolster and foster in children as well. Um, but do you think that children can be fundamentally wise? I think absolutely so. Uh, I mean, we see even in kids who are two and three and four years old, we see some who throw temper tantrums every time they don't get anything. Others are pretty mature. They don't do that. Mm -hmm. Some kids would never share their toys with anybody else, whereas some kids would. Uh, and talking about you, Shafali, growing up, I remember when you were five years old and she, we had a tour of the kindergarten. My wife and I went there. And Shafali took us from one set of parents to another, introduced us to those parents, saying that these are my this friend's parents and that friend's parents. And so for a five-year-old, that was really act of high wisdom. So mm -hmm. <laughs> and we can see that... Uh, now happening today. So, so it shows that yes, you cannot predict future behavior. That's very kind. I will also say though, maybe this is my self-reflection, but is that I also got in trouble all the time for talking in class. Um, and uh, <laughs> so sometimes didn't know how to, uh, you know, uh, self-regulate a bit. So there was that, there was the balance there, but thank you um, for that, those kind words. Um, so no, that's interesting. And I, you know, just to, again, sort of to keep going on this childhood theme, because it's something I think a lot about. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on to some other things I wanted to talk with you about. You know, in your book, actually, you quote the sixth century Chinese poet, um, Lao Tzu, and he said that those who have knowledge do not predict, and those who predict do not have knowledge. And I thought that was a, that that really resonated with me, because in fact, you know, there's so much about um, child, childhood, child development and the developing brain that we don't actually know fundamentally. We're, and so we actually do quite a bit of work in early prediction, right? Because we'd love to be able to early in infancy or early, we'll just say early in development, predict, you know, which children will struggle in certain areas, which children will have some stronger traits in certain areas. Again, in my world, which is much more, you know, sort of clinically focused on neurodevelopmental disorders, we actually conduct studies where we're asking, can we predict in early infancy, which infants will develop autism or which infants will have other developmental challenges, because then we'd like to start monitoring intervening. So, you know, I guess I want, what I want to ask you is, you know, is, do you think that there are or will be or should be ways that we can predict tr wisdom or aspects of wisdom in early, early childhood, even as early as infancy? That's a great question. And this is also something that requires empirical research. Mm -hmm. uh, and the empirical research is going to be a little harder there because we cannot use our wisdom scale in children. I mean, obviously we'll need to develop a different scale because the items will be different. For example, one of the items in our scale is what if you find a $20 bill mm -hmm. that somebody dropped and then you go and give it to him. Those situations don't affect kids. So we'll actually have to change that. So maybe we can work together to develop a scale exactly. for, for kids. But prediction, I think prediction works well at a group level, but not at individual level. Um, you know, group that, I mean, for example, even for something like schizophrenia, uh, there were studies that showed that videotaping kids and especially looking at their motor development in the first two years of life predicted schizophrenia. But that was true only in a large group, not individually. And so, so that's the thing that uh, there are kids who may seem antisocial when they're young and yet they turn out to be you know, they could become sans or um, very compassionate people. So the prediction is far from 100%. Uh, it doesn't, especially when it applies to individual. Actually, one of the comedians said that um, I can predict everything except the future. <laughs> No, and it's a great point. And I think it, you're, you're right. And I think prediction is a tricky term, especially if we're trying to use it at an individual kind of clinical level. All the studies, even in our field in autism, the prediction studies are mostly at a, are entirely actually at a group-based level. But so we've, you know, started reframing that a bit and thinking about risk stratification, right? So how can you put kids into a category that tells you, you know, there are some skills here or traits here that would tell us that there's a higher likelihood that there may be some red flags. And so again, thinking about these constructs that you talk about in wisdom, 
I could imagine that there might be some traits uh, or behaviors that you see, we might be able to see in infancy or toddlerhood or early childhood that really do suggest, you know, this, this person might really struggle with certain areas as they get older. This person might really have, you know, for instance, in a, with emotion regulation or um, even decision-making, those sorts of things. I, I agree. I think that, that that's a really very good point. And I actually, I would say that the next step to that would be finding intervention mm -hmm. in which we can change the behavior at that stage. Mm -hmm. And this uh, slide I showed about this um, study in UK, where those kids in whose upbringing grandparents are involved, they had fewer emotional and other problems. And so, and you know, a similar thing with that uh, experience score thing. Mm -hmm. So if we have older people involved in the upbringing of the kid, I think kids with similar traits will develop differently. Mm -hmm. That if you do some intervention that is helpful, in spite of having those traits in early life, they will turn out to do quite well. Mm -hmm. No, it's a great point. I was going to ask this later, but since I realized we probably have about 10 more minutes of questions, I'll just bring it up now quickly, which is, you know, I think that grandmother, and I'll call it the grandparent hypothesis, is very powerful. I thought those data were really, you know, and I've lived it, I've experienced it firsthand. You know, I'm so lucky, and my sister Neelam is so lucky that we've had, our kids have had you and mom in their lives in a very deep and meaningful way. I mean, for those of you I know most in the audience wouldn't know this, but my dad is, you know, an incredible grandfather that you would expect, but he's, my kids are both tennis players and he, you know, when he goes to a tennis match, he sits on the sideline and he does not move for the entire match and just soaks it all in and enjoys it. And then afterwards we'll give supportive feedback and my kids have really benefited from that. You know, and I think that that relationship truly has made an impact, I think on all of, you know, on our, on our kids development. And I just wonder, you know, there are many families where they don't have the, the privilege and the luxury of having a grandparent nearby, right? And so, you know, are there other approaches that we can take to kind of provide children with those same opportunities, you know, because there's so, there's such rich, rich, beautiful experiences that they can have. I, I think the intergenerational activities are really critical. Yeah. Not only critical for the kids, but they're also critical for the older people. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that I think in this country, I mean, one of the things that is problematic is the ageism. Um, there is so much ageism, you know, I mean, the number of older people is increasing, we all know that. And people call it silver tsunami, as if it's a disaster happening to the society, that number of older people is increasing. Why? Because they cost more in terms of health. That's so wrong, because studies show that if you keep older people active, and again, using that experience score as an example, where the retired people, they spend some time in public elementary schools, their health improved, their own biomarkers improved, their hippocampus did not shrink, mm -hmm. and the kids did very well. As a society, we got to do more promotion of activities like that, intergenerational activities, which are helpful for both the generations. Mm -hmm. I think unfortunately the ageism says that if you spend money on older people, that means we are not spending on the younger people. That's so wrong. There is no generational war. We really need to have, again, more intergenerational support that is needed for the society as a whole. Because if the older people are happier, if they are healthier, they will cost less, mm -hmm. right? So the healthcare cost also goes down. So every which way you look at it, socioeconomically, politically, administratively, health-wise, it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. So I really think the more we can do that. So for people who don't have grandparents, and that's quite common, unfortunately, then you don't need biological grandparents. You need grandparent substitutes. So other older people in the community or even elsewhere, now with Zoom, they can FaceTime and so on. So there are a bunch of things that can be done to promote such activities. No, that actually the Zoom is a great point. And I think that, you know, if we get to to talk about COVID, maybe we won't because we've talked enough about COVID over the last year. But you know, one of the few silver linings was that we learned that we can connect with each other remotely, and we don't need to be necessarily geographically co-located, right, to be connected. And I think that was a very powerful um, lesson. I think that many of us learned. Um, so you know, I want to switch gears a little bit and, and ask you. You 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 have um, in your chapter becoming wiser faster you make a really important point. You say medicine has become too narrowly focused on illness, pathology, risk factors, and treatment of illness. 
Um, and we must broaden medicine to include health and not just diseases, right? So you say physicians need to treat illnesses, of course, but they also must study and promote positive protective factors like resilience, optimism, wisdom, and positive health outcomes like well being. So you've really been the spokesperson for this concept of positive psychiatry. So I wonder, I, I know there's a lot of physicians listening today, you know, what tips would you give for physicians or other providers on how best to support the well-being of their patients and to really maybe even think about reframing the way we approach medicine um, away from illness towards health? Right. Again, that, that's a very important question. I think what happens as physicians, when we see a patient, the questions we ask are, what are your symptoms? What are the risk factors? And essentially, what is wrong with you? That's what we want to find out. We don't ever ask them what is right with you. What are the things you enjoy? What are the things you are strong in? What makes you happy? These are not silly questions. They are important questions because they are the things that person needs to reduce their level of stress. Most people are stressed out. You know, I mean, the, from time to time, there are different stresses. And what overcomes the stresses are things like resilience, optimism, compassion, um, social engagement. Uh, there are meta-analyses that have shown that social support and social engagement have greater effect size in terms of not just morbidity, but also mortality. The effect of social engagement on mortality is greater than the effect of smoking, physical inactivity, or poor nutrition. It's really amazing. And yet we don't do that. As physicians, we should really ask about something positive because that makes the patient feels good, patient feels confident, and that will help reduce the stress, which will actually improve most illnesses uh, and symptoms to some extent. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, I, was, I also just want to make the point that we, we're seeing in our um, in our world now, especially during COVID, just an increasing amount of physician burnout. So we talk about you know positive positivity as physicians take care of patients, but I think it's really important for us as physicians and healthcare providers to also take care of ourselves and sort of thinking about some of these same principles around staying connected, um, uh, you know, and, and and trying to prioritize our own well-being is incredibly important. Right. Um, and I think your message is loud and clear there. Sorry, did you want to? Comment on yeah, that. No, I think that this is one of those things. Physician heal thyself. Uh, and the number of suicides has been growing in medical students, also in physicians. Part of the reason is, of course, we have access to things that can kill, like overdoses of toxins. Uh, and we really need to be careful about that. Medical schools, for example, are really the houses of stress. We expect them to be absolutely perfect in everything. They cannot make a mistake, which makes a life so stressful. And physicians who are very compassionate toward others, they don't have enough self-compassion. They cannot tolerate an error that they make. And of course, there is fear of lawsuits and so on. But the life has become actually increasingly stressful for physicians, partly also because of these computerized records and so on. So the personal contact has gone down and that has not only affected patients, it has affected physicians. So I think that needs to change. I think one of the things I'm glad actually that is happening at UCSD uh, and some other medical school, there's no compassion training for medical students. You know, I really think this should start from kindergarten onwards. We have classes for physical exercise. We have classes for arts. Why don't we have classes for self-reflection, compassion, and emotional regulation? We should not only teach them, but we should also reward them. We shouldn't only reward them because they get the highest score or they win the championship. That's fine. But what about the sportsmanship award in sports, for example, and so on and so forth? I think this is something that is needed that, um, I mean, I know along that line too, that one of your sons actually got the sportsmanship award and that's, uh, uh, I really appreciate their having that award there. 
it's the same thing needs to happen actually. People need to be rewarded for compassion, empathy, and so on in schools and medical schools and physicians, so on. No, I think it's a fantastic point. Um, there's so many more things I wanna talk about. We only have a couple of minutes. I'm gonna actually um, ask you a question that I think is really relevant in our society now. And as a, again, as a parent, I see this with kids, but I think I'm, I'm also guilty of this as well. You know, you talk so much about pro-social behavior being really a, a very critical aspect of wisdom. Uh, you know, and you allude a little bit and talk a bit about social media and sort of the changing landscape of social interaction and how that might impact our social behavior, social cognition. And I think, you know, I think a lot about this because it's true, our social interaction has gone from seeing people in person and to, you know, forget about COVID for a minute, but just seeing people in person talking on the phone to quick text messages that don't even have full sentences, let alone, you know, any kind of, um, you know, more direct kind of human contact. You know, which I, you know, I, you would think maybe would affect, uh, you know, aspects of social cognition like empathy or theory of mind. Although at the same time, we're actually much more connected, although at a superficial level, than we ever were before, right? Constantly, we're getting. You give the stat of how many text messages people get a day, three to four hundred a day, depending on the age. So I just wonder if you could just comment on how social media and the changing landscape of social interaction has impacted either negatively or positively, you know, our ability to kind of uh, develop pro-social behaviors. I think so, social media has been a mixed blessing and curse, no question about that. And it also depends on how it is used. And actually COVID is a good example for that. So with the restrictions that came in, in terms of social distancing and so on, younger people, their use of social media increase, more Facebook, Twitter and so on. Older people until then, actually many of them had never used the social media. Some of them actually began using it, right? So original thought was that the older people would do terribly because they had more physical illnesses with COVID, more severe complications, hospitalization, death. Uh, so they were at high risk of everything. And also they didn't know how to use technology. Many of them they didn't have technology, right? Younger people, on the other hand, physically they were doing great and they had all the technology. You know what happened to the mental health? The statistics are amazing. These are paper published in one of the JAMA journals recently. They found that the prevalence of anxiety, depression, and stress was 75% in people between 18 and 25. Okay. Whereas in people over 65, it was only 15%. And I think part of that, I really think is related to social media, not entirely, but partly that social media, because the younger people had hundreds, if not thousands of contact, very superficial, sometimes very negative. They actually had a negative impact on their mental health. But the older people used it in a very limited fashion and only with those people they knew. So that actually improved the quality of the relationship and they did better. So, so your point is very well taken. I think social media, if they only help foster superficial relationships, which are often negative, they are not helpful. Yeah, and I think we need to really, you know, again, as you said, it's sort of a blessing and a curse. I mean, I think this is for, for our current, you know, uh, landscape that this is how we communicate. It is at a somewhat more superficial level, but it does allow us again to connect with more people. So I think, you know, as I think through this, as you're talking, you know, I think even as us as parents helping our children ensure that they still maintain and develop those more, you know, real relationships, you know, while still having that constant contact with the hundreds of others that they can, I think that's really going to be important. Um, because it could, again, as you said, be very helpful because it does actually allow people to stay connected in some way. Um, you know, along those lines, I think with so much access to information and the social media and all the different platforms, it really, I think, undermines our ability to take the time um, or maybe our willingness to take the time to really self-reflect. And you even talk about this, you know, phenomenon of like, there's no time to think. I think you had like a chapter or a sub-chapter that was, um, and that kind of, that got me right in the gut because I completely feel that and agree with that. And, you know, as an academic, like we want, we need time to think, but we're in a, at a time where it becomes much harder to do that. 
um, you know, do you have just as lasting sort of final thoughts, you know, any advice on how for all of us who are in this very, very busy information filled world, how do we take that time um, to think? Okay, a very, very brief response. So I think we need to make it a habit to just set aside half an hour uh, every other day or fixed time and make it a fixed time. It could be during exercise. It could be before going to bed. It could be while eating breakfast. Leave that time for self-reflection. Just think about what happened in the last th two, three days. What made you feel happy? What made you feel stressed out? Try to understand yourself. Well, this was a lot of fun. And the good news is my dad and I talk all the time. So I can ask you the rest of these questions later. Um, but Vicky, thank you. And, and to the Friends of Semmel, thank you for allowing me to have this dialogue with my dad. It was a lot of fun and I learned a lot. I always learn quite a, learn so much from him every time. So thank you. Well, truly, it was our honor to have you both for this important program. And thank you for sharing so much wisdom with us. I think you gave everybody a lot to think about and unpack and, and improve in their daily lives. So thank you for that. Um, and as a grandparent, I was just delighted to see that slide about the grandparents. So thank you for that. Um, we do have some questions from the audience, so I'll get started here. Uh, first question is from Lewis. Have you studied the effect of meditation and study of Zen in development of wisdom as well as high quality longevity? Yeah, there actually have been a number of very well done studies of meditation, uh, including some randomized controlled trials that show the benefits of meditation. Um, again, there are different types of meditation depending on the duration and so on, but there are studies that clearly show, for example, that the brain structure and function improve um, using functional MRI, for example. Um, similarly, they have shown that uh, health, physical health also improves. Uh, mental health, of course, improves. Uh, improvement in cognitive function. Um, longevity, I don't know yet because those will need to be uh, long-term studies of uh, lots of people, but I would expect that it would go up to. Thank you. Um, a question from John on resilience. Where would this fit in your wisdom model? So resilience is actually an important part of wisdom. So what does resilience mean? Resilience means facing the stress in such a way that you actually grow from it. So it's like instead of post-traumatic stress disorder, you develop post-traumatic growth. And so if you look at the components of wisdom, if you have self-reflection, emotional regulation, empathy, compassion, including self-compassion, decisiveness, those are all things that will lead to greater resilience. So I see resilience and wisdom as being closely connected. Shafali, did you want to add anything? No, I'm, sh I'm nodding because I think oh, yeah. it's a really important point about resilience, but no, I'll let him answer. He's lots of questions. <laughs> okay. um, a question from John, how do you think about the overlap between personality and spirituality. Are they synonymous or are there fundamental differences? I would think about spirituality as a component of personality uh, because spirituality, again, it is defined differently by different people. But for us, spirituality means, as I said, constant connectedness with something or someone that we don't see or hear. Again, as I said, we can call it spirit, soul, consciousness, or God. And it is helpful in the sense you never feel lonely because even if you are by yourself, there's nobody surrounding you. Still, you feel connected with something or someone there. And that gives the sense of calmness, some control, feeling good about yourself. So it is going to lead to less stress and more happiness. Again, that doesn't happen to everybody, but many people, it would. Uh, so, it's, so I would say it is more of a part of a personality than personality itself. Thank you. Um, question here about 
wisdom in twins and siblings. Um, and asking, you know, is there a study on that? Uh, that? This is from Pat and wondered if you could comment on that. Thank you for asking that question. And I hope that people in the audience who are geneticists, or that they would study it. I think one of the problems with wisdom has been that until recently, wisdom was not studied by people in the medical field or by neuroscientists. So wisdom research has been a province of gerontologists, sociologists, and psychologists, not biologists. And that's why a number of important studies remain to be done. And they include genetic studies, including twin studies. Um, and really, we need science along that line. Uh, so we are actually trying to see if we can connect with some group that is doing genetic studies and all that they have to do is add a scale for wisdom and then we can study it. So this is a, it's a really important question. I mean, my sense is that as I said, wisdom is probably, I would say more than 50%, I would say about 60, 65% environmentally determined and about 25 to 35% genetically determined. So we will see some similarities between twins, but they will not be 100% similarities. Fascinating. Thank you. A uh, question here from Melissa. Have studies been done showing the relation between bipolar disorder and wisdom? And I know you study schizophrenia, so we can add that there too. You know, that uh, it's really a very interesting question of bipolar. I mean, probably what you probably also wanted to ask was uh, if there is a difference in the bipolar patient uh, between the phases of depression versus uh, hypomania. Mm. Great question. Again, we need to study that again. So we published a paper on um, wisdom in schizophrenia we compared with uh, healthy subjects, non-psychiatrically ill. And as expected, schizophrenia is associated with cognitive impairment, obviously, uh, and psychotic symptoms. So their scores on wisdom were lower However, they were not lower on pro-social behaviors. They were as compassionate, empathic as uh, other people. And importantly, we found that within schizophrenia group, those who scored higher on wisdom, they had better mental health, better physical health, better cognitive functioning. And they're also more likely to be adherent to treatments. Again, somebody like John Nash uh, or here, Ellen Sachs, at, uh, she's on the UCLA USC faculty. Great examples of people with schizophrenia who display high level of wisdom. Uh, Ellen Sachs has actually spoken for us several times and she is a very wise person in many, many ways. Um, Comment here from Maury and question. Your family is inspirational and I will second that. Amazing. Uh, many families don't even have a live-in father. How do we convey this information and the related transcendence to these overwhelmed mothers, single mothers? Well, there is no question about that. The, the help is needed. There's no question about that. And when we talk about help for single mothers, we talk about financial help. That's not the only help that is needed. Mm -hmm. The kids need more. And there should be some programs that are facilitated by schools, businesses, and government, where I think that's the worst deprivation that the kids have, is when they don't have parent and grandparent substitutes. Um, and in a way, coming back to this parent question, then the study I showed about the study in UK, where they com compared kids from single parent families who, in whose upbringing grandparents were involved with those in whose grandparents are not involved, the significant difference in how they grew up. So I would say that anything that can be done to get older people's involvement in their upbringing would be very helpful. Oh, sorry, it got very windy outside and our door slammed. I'm so sorry. Um, well, I'm so sorry to have to end this conversation because it has been fascinating and full of so much wisdom. Thank you both 
um, for taking the time to participate in our open mind. We are really grateful to you. And um, I think we all leave just a little bit wiser. So thank you. And I wish everybody a healthy and wise evening. Thank you, Vicky, for having us here. It's a pleasure. An honor. So much. Truly.